Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Oh, we're not supposed to do that. Yeah, I said that you can. <laughs> no, we can. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. In honor of Veterans Day, you did too. Anyway, <laughs> not. Uh, Councilor Vidal. Present. Councilor Lopez. Yeah. Councilor Rodriguez. Yeah. Councilor Brown. <laughs> Councilor Bishop. Present. Councilor Tejada. Councilor Abazaneda. Councilor Robinson. Yeah. Councilor Perlotonda. Councilor Garcia. Present. Councilor Ray Cooper. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven members present. You have a quorum, Madam Chairman. I just want to say for the record that Councilor Abazaneda will not be in attendance, and Councilor Perlotonda uh, said he'd be arriving late. The conference is uh, the fiscal year 2019 tax rate schedule. Officials invited to attend the city manager, Tom Ambrosino, Mary Lou Island, director of assessing, honorable members of the council, interested parties, all members of the public. This meeting was called by the city manager to discuss the uh, tax rate, so you have the floor, Mr. Ambrosino. Uh, so thank you, Madam President. Uh, good, uh, good evening. Uh, uh, members of the council. So I'm going to do a brief presentation, an overview of uh, the interim year valuation for fiscal year 19 and our expected tax rate for FY19. As you'll see, you have to take some votes on this uh, rate at your November 19th meeting. We'll have a public hearing. The hearing will be uh, very brief, and then you'll have to take two votes, which I will go over. The presentation I'm going to give tonight is, should be very familiar to you. It's very similar to presentations I've given in the past. It's really quite simple. Uh, you might think too simple, but I think it's helpful, particularly for the general public watching on TV who don't really have immersion in municipal finance. So this is very simple and basic, but I think it'll be explanatory. So. I will go through it fairly expeditiously, and then I can answer any questions that you have. You have the PowerPoint in front of you, you can follow along, but it's gonna be right up here. So, um, <coughs> so as I said, this is basically, the first part is I'm just gonna give you an overview of our budget and taxes. Remember, you passed the budget last June. That's the total amount of our budget. That's everything we need to raise in order to do our business for fiscal year 19. It includes all the appropriations you approved in uh, June. It includes all of our water and sewer budget. It includes the amount we set aside for overlay, and it includes all the charges for the, from the Commonwealth. We have to pay all of this money in order to meet our uh, required finances for fiscal year 19. So how do we raise $197 million? Well, as you know, we've got three main revenue sources. The first is state aid. Of the $197 million, the state is giving us $89.2 million, mostly in the form of school aid, but also some general uh, municipal aid as well. That's $89 million. The next major revenue source are receipts, motor vehicle excise tax, room excise tax, meals tax, water and sewer uh, charges, and building permit fees, those sorts of things. All of that adds up to another $49 million. And then the third major source of revenue besides state aid and local receipts are the property taxes, the taxes that residential property owners uh, uh, and commercial property owners pay for a property that they own in the city. That number is made up of two components. One is sort of the basic number, what you are allowed to raise under Proposition 2.5, and, and you add to that new growth, new development that generates new tax dollars. The total of that is uh, almost $58 million. All of that adds up to that number right there, 196.2 million. So we were short, and that was the difference that you made up with an appropriation of free cash back in June. When I presented the budget in June, I told you that it was out of balance by $798,919, and that is exactly what you appropriated from free cash in June 
to cover this uh, differential. And so that's how we cover our $197 million in expenses for fiscal year 19. Now I'm going to focus on one of those, which is just the taxes. So as I said, we all know about Proposition 2 and a half. But what Proposition 2 and a half means is that you can only raise your total tax levy by 2 and a half percent. So every year you take the prior year's maximum tax levy, and in this case it was $54.8 million. You multiply that by 2 and a half, you get $1.3 million. That's new taxes that we can raise under Proposition 2 and a half. You do, however, add to that what you can raise by way of new growth. New growth is from new uh, developments that occur in the city. As I've said, ad nauseum, it's why there's so much pressure for cities to de keep developing because new growth is your only way out of the constraints of Proposition 2.5. So that added another 1.6 million. So we, we, we are able to raise in new tax dollars in fiscal year 19 about $3 million. That means we've got to cover all of our new expenses between 18 and 19 with only three million more, more million in tax dollars. Now, that total, 57.9, I'll round, round it up to 58 million, that's allocated among all the individual taxpayers. That's the cap that two and a half imposes on the city. Individual taxes can go up in all sorts of different percentages. They have no limit under Proposition two and a half. Proposition two and a half is a total tax limit. It has nothing to do with what you pay in individual taxes. That is all dictated by valuation. What the value of your home is. And now we'll turn to valuation. That's what I just said. Okay, the interim year of valuation. I say it's interim year because this is one of those years where it's not a special year. Uh, you do have to revalue property every single year, but in certain years you have to have certified valuations, and in certain years you have to do full uh, comprehensive evaluation, revaluation, which means going into people's homes. Next year is a certification year, which means it's a little more work for us. We have to certify values, and then a few years after that we have to do one of those in-home valuations, that's every nine years, correct? Okay. So next year, it's going to be a little more comprehensive, the valuation we have to do, and it'll cost us a little more money. So the FY20 budget will have a little more money in there for our valuation. All right, so why did we have a valuation? Well, they're mandatory, as I said. DOI will not let you set a rate without a valuation. Uh, you have to do it on an annual basis. Every five years have to be certified, that'll be next year. Every nine years is the complete one. So just a little bit of what valuation means. It means your home is uh, supposed to be valued at full and fair cash value, fair market value. It's basically what a willing buyer would pay to a willing seller in this open market. And so, just the, the one thing to remember when you're talking about municipal valuations, you will see them on your first actual tax bill, the one that's mailed on January 1st. That'll have a valuation, the new valuation for 19. It's for FY19. It's based upon what we think your home was valued on as of the previous January 1st. January 1 of 2018. That's the value we measure for fiscal year 19. So it's a year before we're saying what your home was valued. That valuation is based on sales from calendar year 17. So when you get your tax bill on January 1, 2019, that new valuation that the city has given you is reflective of sales that often took place 18 months before. So municipal valuations always trail the market by about 18 months. So if values are rising, your valuation on January 1 of 19 won't show that. Your value will be behind the curve by about 18 months. If values are dropping, 
it also won't show that. Your value will be probably higher than your home was actually worth. In a declining market, that is often the case with municipalities because the valuations are running behind the market cycle by about 18 months. So we finished the valuation. We've sent our values into DOR. They're going to certify them relatively soon. We have no reason to think they're not going to certify our values. And this is what our new valuation has shown. This is the increase. It's still a rising market, at least based on sales from calendar year 17. And the column for FY19 shows you how values are rising or rose in that year. So significant increases for residential properties, not so much in terms of commercial industrial properties. And you can see in this chart how those valuation changes compared to valuation changes in FY18. This is just, you have this, it's just a graph that shows you the valuation changes for these various uh, types of units. Now, we try to help residential property owners despite this rising market. And we do it really in two major ways. The first way is we do a shift of the tax burden to commercial and industrial properties. We do the maximum shift allowed by law, which is 1.75%. It means that commercial and industrial properties, if you take this vote, which you've taken for the last generation in Chelsea, to do the maximum shift to commercial and industrial property owners, it will mean that commercial and industrial property owners pay 1.75% more than they otherwise would have paid without this shift. I strongly encourage you to take this vote. The city of Chelsea has taken this vote every year for probably the last 30 years, and I would encourage you to take this vote again on November 19th to shift the burden, the maximum allowed by law, to commercial and industrial property owners in order to protect residential property owners. In addition, the second major thing that you do is you give a residential exemption. Not many communities do. There's only about 13 or 14 communities that provide the residential exemption. You give a residential exemption. Right now, you give a residential exemption worth 27.5% of average residential value. That's the percentage that's in effect for fiscal year 18. You have to choose a percentage for fiscal year 19. You can choose anything between 27.5% and 35%. The law allows you to go up to 35%. As I've been telling you each and every year, I think the more appropriate approach is to gradually get up to 35% so that you continually have something to offer residential owners each and every year because once you reach a 35% cap, you will not be able to offer any more relief. So these are, and so I know what the rate will be depending, I know what the tax rate will be depending upon what residential exemption percentage you choose. The commercial tax rate should be $29.15. That compares to I think it was 29, I don't have that, so it was, it's 29 something right now, 29.74 this year. Uh, so it'll be, it'll be dropping a little bit for commercial, it'll be 29.15, give or take a penny or two, because again, the valuations have to be certified by DOR, and once all our final figures are in, the rate could change by a penny or so, but it won't change more than that. And then the residential rate will depend upon which uh, residential exemption you choose. So this chart that I'm gonna show you now that you have in front of you is going to tell you what, uh, it, it basically sets forth all the different remaining scenarios that exist for the residential exemption. So right now, you're at 27.5%. If you stayed at 27.5%, residential rate would be $14.07, and this would be the impact on each of these various types of residential properties. 
So you can go to that last column, you can see how much they would increase. What's going down are condos, and that's just a reflection of condo values did not rise as significantly, they rose, but not nearly as significantly as other uh, residential parcels rose in this last year. And so they would get a tax deduction, a, 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 uh, a decrease in their taxes next year, even if you stayed at the 27.5%. The next option, the 30% option, is the option that I'm recommending to you. That would result in a proposed tax rate of $14.26. You can see what the average tax bill would be like for each of those various types of properties and what the difference would be in the tax bill. So if you adopt the 30% residential exemption, single family homes will go up only $36 for the whole year. This is the average tax bill. Every home will be different, but if you average them all, this will be the increase for single families. The condos will drop by almost $280. Two families will be up 243. Three families will be paying another $449 a year in taxes under this scenario. And then you can see the other two scenarios. Obviously, the higher the residential exemption, the more beneficial the impact is on average tax bills for each of these parcels. But as I say, uh, the downside is you have nothing left in your quiver for uh, next year or any year after that. So I'm recommending this 30% option, uh, which uh, for certainly for singles and condo owners is a very modest, uh, is for condo owners, this is very good news. For single family homeowners, this is a very modest tax increase. For two, even for two families, $240 a month, that is a, I would say that's in the moderate range of tax increases. Uh, three families are paying, uh, uh, more, and that's all a function of values. The values of three families and the values of two families continue to rise at a greater rate than the values of other parcels. But this is your decision come November 19th, what percentage you wish to offer. This chart is just how various, how much of the total tax levy is paid by various types of property. Now, I just do want to mention the other assistance that we provide in addition to the split tax rate and the uh, residential exemption. You do offer pretty healthy uh, uh, exemptions if you qualify. These are mostly senior exemptions, uh, but this is the Clause 17E. These are the requirements. This is an exemption. It has a high age limit. You have to be 70 years or older, uh, but it doesn't have any income limit. You can make as much money as you wish, but it does have an asset limit, which gets adjusted each year for inflation. And this exemption, uh, without the doubling that I'll talk about in a minute, is worth $187 this year. This exemption goes up a little bit each year by the rate of inflation. And then the second, a more significant exemption that you offer is the Clause 41D. This, you don't have to be 70, you will only have to be 65 to qualify here. This is worth a lot more money. It's worth $1,000 off your tax bill, but it has more stringent uh, requirements, including lower income limits, and it has an asset limit that does not include your home. And then you do something else that's very beneficial, which is you double the value of all the exemptions. So that $1,000 exemption really is worth $2,000, uh, uh, provided you're not paying less taxes than you paid the year before. And you do the small commercial owner's exemption, which means that if you have personal property as a commercial owner that's valued at under 10,000, you are fully exempt. You don't pay any personal property tax, personal property tax. You still pay real estate taxes, but you are exempt. But just keep in mind, this is a hard cap, 10,000. So if your property is worth $10,001, you pay full property taxes, correct? 
that's right. <laughs> All right. Um, and that, I think, is just about it, other than what happens next. And what happens next is November 19th. It's the tax rate classification hearing. You'll have the final certified figures from DOR. The numbers will, may change by a penny or so in terms of the tax rate, but I wouldn't expect any deviation beyond that. And you have to take two votes. The first vote is to shift the maximum burden to commercial, industrial, and personal property class, classes. And we always recommend the maximum shift of 175%. And then the residential exemption, again, the max is 35%. I would recommend 30 so that you still have uh, uh, opportunity to further increase that next year and the years after that. You certainly don't have to go to 30. You can actually choose any exemption between uh, 20 and 35. Uh, I wouldn't recommend choosing less than you've got right now because then everyone would get a substantial tax increase, but you could stay at 27.5 if you wish, and I gave you that option and you can see how it impacts each of the individual uh, owners. And that's the presentation. So I can certainly, I know it was simple, but I think that's all really uh, residents need to know about this system of setting, of valuing property and setting uh, tax rates. It's, it's straightforward. It's not always, the outcomes aren't always what we want, but they are a function typically of valuations. So Thank with you. that said, I'll answer any questions. As Thank you, Ms. Ambrosino. Before I open it up for questions, I just want you to clarify something. Yes. Um, you were talking about Clause 17E and 41D, and you said that we here in City Council that we double the statutory exemptions. Yes. So Can you, you explain that to me like I'm a five-year-old? Yes. You have adopted this provision in the law that basically says you can, the statutory values of the exemptions can all be doubled and you've done that. You've accepted that local option provision that basically provides uh, uh, residents of Chelsea would double the value that these statutory exemptions otherwise would provide. So wh whereas the 17D exemption, um, if we go back to that page, this year that exemption is worth $187. But in Chelsea, that's worth double that, okay. whatever that comes up to, 374, uh, if that math is correct. And so it's that's what that's worth in the city of Chelsea. You've adopted this local option. You only have to adopt it once. You've adopted it, and so it means that everyone's exemptions get doubled. So the $1,000 exemption for seniors who qualify for that exemption, it's not easy to qualify for. It has strict eligibility requirements, but it would be worth 1000 under the statute, but it's worth 2000 in Chelsea. Now, there is a limitation, which is you can't pay less taxes than you paid the year before. So you have to at least pay, no matter how much you're getting in exemptions, you've got to at least pay in taxes what you paid the year before. So if somehow all these exemptions that you get, the residential exemption, this doubling of the 1000 brings you in a particular year because of your specific valuation of your property below what you otherwise paid us last year, you have to pay us what you paid us last year. Okay, so it might only be worth 1800 to you okay. because otherwise you'd dip below what you paid us last year. But it's a doubling of the statutory, statutory values. Exemption. And it. that's something that not a lot of communities do, but Chelsea has done it. All right, thank you. Any councilors have any questions? Councilor Tejada. Uh, um, Mr. Ambrosino, quick question on the clauses, the, the, the 41D and all. So, how do I, re is it automatic or do our residents have to apply for no, it? No, you have to apply for and them. Where each do they and go for year. that? The assessor's department? The assessor's office, yes. Okay, thank you. And you have until March 31st? Yes. Gotcha. I just yeah. turned 70. So but you have each tax year until <laughs> March 31st. But if you want to actually see it reflected in the bill you're going to get in January, you need to come in now. Okay. Oh, they changed the date to April 1st, I've been told. Yes. Is that it? Any, anyone? Councilor Recupero. I have a question. Please speak into the microphone. I have a question. 
it seems like every year it goes to the same way. You said earlier two and a half is overall, but then we shift it to whoever we decide the city is going to shift it to. It's not a. F We're always saying we want to keep tenants here. If you keep shifting it to the same ones, the tenants will be gone because the same ones. I've been here all the years that I've been here. There hasn't been one year where it hasn't been shifted to the same persons. The same dwellings have always got the same amount. I've never seen one year where they're lower. They've always been higher than anybody else. Why is it always the same ones? They get the same shift, uh, but they get the shaft and the shift. And that's just purely a function of valuation. So every year you've been here, every year I've been here, valuations for multifamily dwellings have been rising faster than valuations of single family homes and condos. So every year, those people have been absorbing more and more of the total tax levy because their values are rising faster than va other valuations. Now, one interesting thing that happened this year is that no, large apartment buildings did not go up much in value. So large, so if you go back to the uh, page in which I identify valuation increases as a chart, uh, it's on page 10. You will see that nine plus family homes only went up, nine plus family dwellings only went up 1% this year. It's uh, kind of odd, but that's the reality. Mr. Ambrosino, one north, would that constitute a commercial building or a nine plus family? A nine plus family. Yeah. Uh, there's something else too, Mr. Ambrosino. Over here, right, on this tax rate on page 15, right, you said that the two and the three, their price went sky high, the value increased a lot, right? But I see here, the single family went sky high. An average single family is 321,000. Yes, that's the so average. That's, that's the median. Increase would only be, what is it, $36 a year. So if they went skyrocketing, why is there so low? You, you said you assess it on the property value according to how much your houses go up, right? Well, the single family went skyrocketed went to 321,000 for a single family, but they increase, they increase, catch up to the rest. Because it, even though it went up significantly in value by 9%, it didn't go up as much as twos and threes, which went up over 11%. But if you look at it, the 11% to 9%, a two and three is an average of $243. They went up and it's only $36 a year. So that's a big disparity because you're starting out with higher values. So an 11% increase on a higher value is a higher number. And that's why you're seeing that. This is all just a function of valuations. We're not manipulating these numbers. The but numbers are the numbers. They have to be certified by the Department but of Revenue. By valuation here, the single family went skyrocket. Compared, look at the three, two and three. It's 415, that's for a two and a three, 500 and something, right? Yeah. The single is 321, so it increased by what, 50%? What was it last year? 200 and some odd thousand for a single? Now it's, what was it, 300? No, the increase, that's 9% higher than last year. I don't know what that math is, i sure. But I it still increased a lot, but the tax rate decreased. This is, as I said, this is just a function of value. And these numbers, there's no manipulation, as I said, of these numbers. These numbers need to be certified by DOR, but we're pretty confident these are the correct numbers, and this is what DOR will certify. So who sets that, the rate? We do, or the, who sets the rate? We're setting the rate depending okay, so upon which residential exemption you choose. That will determine the rate. So depending upon which exemption, which ex how much you're going to exempt for, of the total value for residential properties, that will determine what the tax rate is. The higher the percentage of residential exemption, the higher your tax rate is going to be.
But over here, if you look at your tax rate here, mm -hmm. as you keep going up in your tax rate, yes. the two and three family keep getting more money. They pay more. So how does it function that you're getting 35% but yet you're paying more? No, the two and th if, if you compare what a two. 30%, you're at, at 40, 243, right? Then you go here at 35%, you become 553. I'm sorry, show me those two numbers. See, on uh, this is page 15, the yeah. next page, right? What it number says, are you looking at on 15? Right here, tax rate and exemption options. Of which percentage? Okay, you're looking here, 30%, right? Yeah, of what column? It's 449, right? Three family and two? Three families will go up $449, correct. Okay, now you go back in the next page, right? Yeah. It's 35%, and it increased instead of decreasing. Now it's 553. No, I'm not seeing 553. It's 200 for a 35% exemption. A three family would be paying $284 more 84. a year as opposed but to 449. Shouldn't it decrease a little more than that? I mean, these are the numbers. So if you use 35%, those are what the tax bill will look like for those parcels. So a three family homeowner at 35%, the look at the two families. They're only $33. Right, because you're giving them a greater, you're exempting more of their value from taxation. The more of their value you exempt from taxation, the lesser their tax bill is going to So in to other be. words, the three families, instead of making a benefit, they will lose. The two family will gain. No, the three family will gain as well. If the Big dip difference from... Uh, the two family here they were two forty three and now they're down to thirty three dollars. Yes. And the three family goes from four hundred and forty nine dollars to two hundred and eighty four dollars. It's a reduction of not quite what a two family reduction would be, but it's still a significant reduction if you chose the thirty five percent exemption as opposed to the 30% exemption, but I wouldn't recommend that for all the reasons I've discussed in the past. What would you recommend, a 30%? 30%, no more than that. This still leaves you with options for the next couple of years at least. And then what about the budget? But uh, I have the questions, regardless of the question, it's still gonna be said. It doesn't really matter. That's okay, the questions is all done. I still don't understand how a 30%, a single family can only pay $36 when they increased value went from 9% and the, the, the two and three only went 11. That's 3% more, but look at the difference from $36 to $449. That they only increase in $33 in a whole year, right? Is that a whole year? $36 a year, a year is right? the difference between the average tax bill. But that's what I don't understand. You say, but their value went up, increased a whole bunch. It went to 321000 for a single family. Yeah, so, but, but what he's saying is that the value of the three family went up more. Not really. <laughs> okay. Not really, not according to this. You know, it only went up 200000 more. But you have a three family and a single. You know, but then even the disparity, how can you get even a two family, $243 and a single family, 36, and a condo, which is a single family, right? Isn't a condo a single family? It is, but they're valued differently. So you- Even they get in it, they get $279. Because their values did not go up anywhere near what other values went up in the city. You mean their, their value dropped? It didn't drop. I have to flip back to that page, but the condos only went up by minus 7.4%, whereas everything else was going up 9 and 11%. Now, last year it was sort of the exact opposite. Condos went up more significantly than other parcels, and so they paid a little bit more in taxes, uh, at least. Uh, 
in comparison than other property owners. This year, they will pay less. And another question I have here too, not that, we're going back to what Councillor Kahada said. When we have this increase for the seniors, right? At yeah. 70 years old, whatever it is, right? Yes. Their total assets is what they earn or do you include their houses as an asset? It's, so on the 17D exemption, there is no limit on income. The only limit is on assets. Asset. It does not include your house. The, uh, the other exemption, the 43, uh, 41D exemption, that has both an asset limit and an income limit. But that's a much higher valued exemption. That's worth 1,000 by statute, 2,000 in the city of Chelsea. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Councilor uh, Council Rodriguez. You know, my understanding, does the city benefit more? Because we see the big trend of converting into condos. Do we lose out if that happens or gain? gain? It really will depend upon the specific revaluation of that parcel. My, those in the real estate business would know more than I, but my sense is a three individual condo units are probably valued much higher than a three family home. So in some sense, the valuation will benefit the city in terms of higher valued properties. Any other questions? Nobody has any other questions? Um, oh, Council Brown. Um, Ms. Kennedy, I wasn't here last year for this part, very important part of the um, debate on the council. What was the exemption last year? Um, what was the exemption last year? I know you made the motion for the the exemption percentage was twenty seven point five percent. That means that you exempted from taxation twenty seven point five percent of the average assessed residential value. What that dollar value was last year, I don't have in this chart. I don't think. What was it? It was worth a little over sixteen hundred dollars. The assessor tells me. That no, last year you could have you chose twenty seven point five percent. Last year you also could have gone up to thirty five percent as well. Yes. So if we, <coughs> so the reason why I ask that question, I see it here on the, um, the diagram here, and what happens if we? keep it down to 27.5 this year. I know your desires are to have it at 30, but I mean, what does it do to our bottom line? So it doesn't do anything to the city's bottom line. None of this does. This is a shifting of tax burden. The city collects the same amount of tax dollars regardless of what exemption you choose. You're just shifting the burden among taxpayers, moving it from owner occupants to non-owner occupants. And the higher exemption, the more you're shifting to non-owner occupants. So if you kept it at 27.5%, it's the first option identified on page 15. The value of the exemption would be worth $1,717. And this is what the average tax, this is the impact on the average tax bill. You'll see in that third column from the end. So a single Is family owner. Yeah. So go ahead, I'm sorry. A single family owner under that scenario would pay on average $157 more in FY19 than he or she paid in FY18. Condos would still pay less by $148. On average, again, this is all averages. Everyone's situation is going to be different. And you'll see the rest just follow that column that says difference in tax bill. If you go to 30%, you'll see the differences. Everyone's taxes, as long as you're an owner occupant, go down a little. But non owner occupants' taxes go up because the tax rate is higher under that scenario. The more you offer in a residential exemption, the more taxes you demand of non-owner occupants, and so the tax rate rises. That's why I asked that question. I was wondering why it was going down here. 
right. I'm all set, Madam President. Any other council representative? Uh, and this would be to Marianne. Um, what year is the data collected from? What was the time period for the sales? Because I know there were always a year or so. Calendar year 17. So from January 1, 2017 to December 31st, 31st 2017. I'm sorry, why don't you say that? We had to use two years of sales for commercial and industrial because we didn't have enough sales. You have to meet the criteria for the DOR, so we used 16 and 17. 2016 and 2017 for commercial. Yeah. And is that a requirement of DOR if you don't have enough sales? Are we all set? Any other questions? Okay. No All right, questions. thank you. So. so on the 19th, there'll be a very brief tax hearing. I will not repeat this, uh, and uh, then you'll have to take your two votes. Thank you, Ms. Ambrosino, for your presentation. We're adjourned.